Thank you for joining us today. Just a few very quick reminders before we get started. All the attendees are muted. If you're using the event app, we encourage you to check into the session, update your activities, and be sure to complete the session survey at the end. This session is TLP white and is being recorded. Recordings will be available within 24 hours via the app. And with that, I'd like to introduce you to your session moderator, Natsuko Inui. Take it away, thank you. Thank you. Um, hi everyone, this is Natsuko Inui. I'll be moderating the session today. Uh, you are at the session, scan, analyze, and test data. Oh my, how to get over the results rainbow. Um, just one thing before we get started. So we ask that you submit your questions for the Q&A in the Q&A section, um, the Q&A function in your Zoom window. Um, the questions will be queued up in the order they are received. And with that, I would let, like to go ahead and get started. And I will start by introducing our speakers today. So we have two speakers from NVIDIA um, and they are both um, senior application developer and lead product security tools team. Um, so we have Jessica and Dee. So Jessica is a senior application developer and lead for NVIDIA's product security tools team. And she has 13, over 13 years of experience um, and earned her master's in computer engineering from Washington University in St. Louis. Um, she also has her own certifications in Java, Ruby and Cisco CCNA. And Dee Anachache is a senior development leader at NVIDIA's security tools platform team. Um, she has 14 years of experience in the software industry and she specializes in architecting and de delivering reliable and scalable systems in a variety of areas, um, especially online services. Um, and with that, I will turn the tables over to Jessica and Dee for their presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, welcome to Scan, Analyze, and Test, Data Oh My, Getting Over the Results Rainbow. I have Dee today. Go ahead, Dee, if you'd like to introduce yourself. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, we got really good introductions I, already, so. Yeah, I know. Thanks, Natsuko, <laughs> for a great introduction. But I will just add, I've been at NVIDIA for over uh, two years now, and I'm really excited to share our registration and reporting platform with you guys. And uh, I am Jessica Butler. I've been with the security tools team at NVIDIA for a little over three years. Um, I've had the privilege of being one of the founding members for the application we're going to share today, Inspect. And actually looking at this picture makes me a little sad. This was after the last first conference. We were able to travel still um, in Portugal. So hopefully soon we'll be out again. Okay, so today I want to talk a bit about um, our journey and kind of how we have landed where we are and where we are in our journey and where we started and all the struggles that have gone on so far. So we'll start with kind of the pitfalls of a manual process of um, working on uh, getting some scanning applications and all the data around that for our product teams at NVIDIA. And we'll talk about some of the different um, applications that we actually use for scanning and the data that we are trying to make sense of and try to present in a way that actually is actionable for our teams. Then we'll talk a little bit about how we are cataloging our software portfolio at NVIDIA. And then we'll move on to kind of where we landed with how we could actually put the onus back on the teams for registering um, all of their applications and their data themselves. Then Dee will take over and talk more about how we're mapping the data so that we can get all of our information into a, a single pane in a, in a place where we can see everything together in a much easier way to visualize the risk that all of our software has or hopefully doesn't have. Um, along with that, we've learned kind of along the way that we need to be able to automate notifications. So she'll go into some of the notifications that we're sending out to our product owners and how we can uh, automate aut automate the issue management and getting all of the tickets in a place where the product teams are used to finding them. After that, we'll touch on calculating risk and we would love to have some questions and have some um, of the audience share with us at that point. So when I started at NVIDIA, um, I had already been a developer for about, uh, I guess, 11 years. So I came and I was new to security. So I came onto the security team um, 
wanting to really kind of build an application around the scanning process. Um, but the way things kind of started was we we already had a tool that we knew we wanted to use for um, open source vulnerability scanning. And so we would, we kind of let the product teams know that we had this tool and we started asking people to have these scans done. Um, and before we were ready with the application, we had teams that would just reach out to us via email or Slack or whatever the, um, I guess, choice of communication was at that time tell us that they were ready to do a release and they knew that they needed to have a scan done um, before they could release. So we would gather the source location, um, run the scanning tool, and then obviously there was more than one source code location that was associated to a product. So we'd have to manually group that data and then we would, would ship that report off to the requester. And some of the tools that we were using at that time, or actually some of the tools that we're using now, um, show data in a way like this. So we're looking at some of the uh, user interfaces for the scanning tools that we use. Um, you can see here, this one, you can see the different open source components that were found. You can see some of the open source vulnerabilities and the security risk over here. You can see the different licenses. Um, and then if you drill down into these, then you can get more information. And also we use Coverity um, and you can see basically the ID of the vulnerability that was found. Um, in this case, it looks like somebody needed to scrub this. So I just grabbed a screenshot of, of one project. Um, you can see the impact you can see first detected. And for check marks, you see something that looks a little bit similar where you get your kind of your, your risk down here. But again, all of these things are kind of foreign and for you to be able to understand what each of the different scan tools are trying to tell you and learn how to use each one and how to drill down into each one takes time. And we don't really want to push that onto all of our product teams. It's hard enough to get them to start the, the security process um, alone. So we wanted to be able to grab all this data together and um, display it in a way that makes sense for not only the owners of each of the products, but all the way up to the um, org three leader or the, the VPs executives that actually own all of this so that they can understand the risk that they are shipping. So we started by defining how do we want to actually catalog all this information in our database? So we knew we needed like a top level product. Um, this is something that is shippable or deployable. We know we need executive ownership at this level so that we can drive these actions. Um, and we allow versioning and we want to make sure that we can capture end of life. After that, we need to be able to break this down into how are things built? How do things go together? How is ownership defined at a component level? And also we know that there are many components at the or in the organization that are shared among many products. So we have this logical segregation that's known as a component and it can have um, many source code locations in it. So many source code repositories, it can be found in many products. Um, we wanna make sure that we have the ownership at this level and we do, we do marry this kind of to a, a build. The next thing that we need to be able to um, show in the database is the dependencies, how things are related. So we know we have internal components already. We can also have external open source software and external third party software. And we know we need to be able to have an, a nested relationship with this. So we built this into our database. And then since the, the first kind of service that we offered was this open source scanning solution, we wanted to make sure that we highlight the things that are open source so we can actually um, track any versioning there and the vulnerability mapping. And then we do have a, a service now in place where we check every night for all of our source code repositories to see if there's been any commits and we will rescan to see if the fix has been applied. So we do fix verification. Okay, so we had all the data in the catalog and we started to actually um, put some of this data in there. In, in your own org, if you're thinking about trying to do something like this, which I highly recommend, um, it would be a good place to like at this point, kind of stop and see, is there a way that you could seed the data for this so that you can uh, kind of 
pre-initialize any level of this, most likely the top level where you have the, the business units and the organization and who owns each product. We weren't able to actually um, get all the information that we needed at this point. And my guess is that you will not be able to find everything that you need down to the granularity that you're going to want to understand how things are built, how things are put together um, and be able to easily collate all those results into a, a proper uh, story, I guess. So we were still kind of in the mode of manually entering this data ourselves. And we had the idea of creating this self-service registration platform so that we could actually tell the users, you should go update this, or you should go add in your new program. And we could kind of take the, the data owning and the data um, mining, I guess, off of our plates so we could focus on what we really want to do and automate the scanning and, and try to build a better dashboard for the security risk. So that's kind of how this self-service registration tool was born. So how our tool looks right now is we ask the user to come in and add any and add the product info. At this point, they can add um, new versions for that product. They can update anything um, in regards to any of the information that you're about to see. Once we have the product info, we have some required contacts. So at, at this time, we require owner and um, direct our BUVP, sorry. And then we have some security contacts that are required as well. Um, our PCERT team works really closely with us. So there's a lot of PCERT contacts that are required at this time as well. The next step that we decided is probably the best way to move forward is to actually understand how everybody at the company is building their projects. So we do have at NVIDIA a few um, homegrown build tools. Um, we also use Jenkins and we use GitLab. So we wanted to actually understand all the different build tools that people are using, as well as um, you know where we can find the artifacts once we can start doing some binary scanning as well. So that's why we're asking for the, the build information. We also can refresh any of the source code locations that are found in the builds since we already have this information. So once a week, we can go through and actually make sure that all the source code locations that we have detected through the build information is updated and we're still up to date, or we can contact the team and let them know that you know we've got some stale data. At this point, when we ask them for the build information, we, we always validate that we can access it. So that's where you're seeing this check mark right here. If we cannot access it, we don't actually add it to our database at this time. And we'll give them some warning messages um, that they can use to try to go figure out why we're not able to access it. Or maybe it's just a typo and they need to try again. So when they click next after they enter their build information, we create components in the database and we actually look at the build and grab the source code locations from that. So that's what you're seeing down here. We also allow teams to enter manually any source code locations in case maybe they're using a script for build that's necessary that we can't actually parse or if they don't have a build set up yet. The next step is linking some services that as the security tools team, we don't own at this time. So in the case of check marks and coverity, these have already, these tools have already been set up by other um, teams at NVIDIA. And so we just need to get the mapping so that we can add the project information, add all the scan data into our dashboards. We also get check marks here, but I didn't, sorry, I forgot to grab a screenshot of that one. And that's it. When they click next after that page, they'll get this summary and it gives them a little bit more information about what they can do next. We have in pipeline scanning as well. So using um, the same scanning tools that we already use for open source vulnerability scanning, we can actually add that to their pipeline. So once they have finished registration and they reach out to us, um, we can add that. We're also working on trying to get some better documentation so that teams can add that without having to reach out to us. But it is a newer thing since we're, we are um, trying to get that into their pipeline. Um, after they register, they also get a report link the next day. And then um, Dee will go over some more of those notifications as well. 
If there's anything that we're missing, we also add that into these areas to improve. And then they do get links to the dashboards at this point, but uh, they actually are not populated until a scan is done. We wanted to make sure that they're not just sitting here during registration waiting for a scan to be done. So they'll see the scan in the dashboards the next day. And I'm gonna go ahead and pass it on to Dee so she can go over how we're mapping all the data and kind of how our dashboards are turning out. Yeah, thank you, Jessica. So now you have 50% of your work done where you have a team that has registered using the registration portal about within 10 minutes. So how do we get to the reports? So you have all the data that they gave you at the registration in our portfolio database. And then you have these different scanning services that you're linking to these programs that are registered. Um, so how do we get to the single pane view of having all the results consolidated um, and married to the hierarchy that they registered with? So that question is answered by our reporting platform. Um, in order to solve this, we were thinking about different routes of how could we get this information into one single data source. And at that point, we thought that an elegant solution of doing this for us could be microservice architecture. And the reason of moving to microservice architecture was uh, primarily two reasons. Uh, one is uh, an ability for us to easily scale when a new tool is added. So say for right now, we have these three services that are being linked uh, to the programs that are registered. One is open source scanning service. Other is a static analysis service, which was your check marks and coverty. Uh, one could be a dynamic analysis service. But say tomorrow we wanted to do a container image scanning. We wanted to be able to add uh, a service that could grab data from that particular service without disper disturbing the core platform. So what we have here is a bunch of network of microservices, which are grabbing data from individual services, marrying it with the information that the user gave us at registration, and then kind of having it into our reporting platform. At this point, um, the reporting solution that we decided to use was Elasticsearch Kibana. So Elasticsearch being our backend data store, and we are leveraging the Kibana visualizations and dashboards. So we have our services running nightly and refreshing all the data from the scan results for all the programs that are registered. And this is the sample of the single pane dashboard much of a simplified version so that you can see it clearly. So what you see on your left hand pane is the results from the open source software scan. You can see at the top we have vulnerabilities kind of divided into a pie chart so that the uh, users can see which ones are critical, which ones are medium, and then we also have kind of divided them by the packages that, that we found. And on the right hand side, you see that we have results from the static analysis tool. So in this case, it was check marks. The idea here is that we should be able to add more panes as we introduce new services. So like I said, if we have a container image scanning, we would just add more visualizations to this pane. We don't want the product teams to be going and chasing down the different tools that we are using and kind of maintaining those UIs. So uh, this is where they would come. This is where project management would come. And I wanna talk a little bit about that here, about the filtering. We wanted to make sure that the reports are uh, kind of dynamic in sense of say tomorrow, we have a team that is planned to register. Uh, we wanted the reporting to be automatic. So we are using the dynamic filtering so that the email that goes out um, is always focusing on the report that is having the scan results for their team. And this is the sample of um, another kind of report that we have, which is more of a details report, which is targeted towards the engineer who would be taking a look at this. So like I said, all in one single pane. At the top, you can see the results from the OSS scan, which is the open source software. And at the bottom, you can see the check marks. And the, here they are able to kind of see which packages were found, what are the vulnerabilities associated with the package, what is the fix recommended by the tool that we use, and same for check marks. So now we have the reporting platform. We have registration taken care of, we have reporting, but we still need to maintain that active communication with the user base that has um, signed up with us. So we have a notification platform so that we are more in control of our communication. So I wanted to walk you guys through some of the notifications that we are sending. Um, once the team registered, we are sending an initial report the next day 
uh, with the scans that have been linked to their registration. Um, we also want to be able to have a weekly email so that they can plan their sprints better. So I know some teams are more proactive in fixing their issues, but we thought that it would be good to remind the teams every Monday that uh, this is where you stand because our dashboards are updated nightly. So there's nothing that is stopping from them to go uh, to their dashboards anytime. So we have that weekly report. Um, then we have a new CVE report. So there are teams who are releasing uh, software um, almost every day in a CI CD fashion. And once they have gone through that security process and they've released their software, we wanted to let them know that it's not really over because new vulnerabilities are constantly discovered for the packages that we found. So we want to be able to let them know that for this package that is in production, there is a new vulnerability that was now discovered and you might want to take a look into that. We also had a requirement from our PCER team where they have channels and pipelines where they are able to know about the undisclosed vulnerability. And we wanted to give them an ability to create a notification manually where we could let the teams know saying that we are aware about this vulnerability and these are the different teams. And if you remember now, Inspect has that ability to find for this particular package, say five teams within NVIDIA are using it. So we have that package discovery alert. And last but not the least, uh, kind of a portfolio health kind of a notification. So we have all this beautiful inventory of builds, repositories, and static analysis projects that we have from teams. So we nightly go and make sure that we still have the right required data, we still have the contacts, and we are kind of letting them know that these are the things that you still need to take care of. Looks like this repository was deleted. Looks like you have moved your branch, and you need to go back to registration and update that info. So you have your reporting, you have your notification, but how do you really make sure that the issues that you are telling them about are remediated? What is the policy for enforcing it? So we wanted to kind of uh, do this issue tracking service or an issue tracking platform. And here are some of the things that we needed to take care of before we do that. So when we talk to the product teams about uh, us being able to create issues into their preferred tool, uh, some of the things that we came to know is that different product teams have different policies. So we wanted to make sure that our issue management platform is able to honor something like a bring your own policy, because different teams uh, work with different security architects who know more about um, the use cases that are relevant to their business scenarios. So they could have different policies and we wanted to make sure that the issue tracking system is aware about those policies. Another thing we wanted to take care of was uh, deduplication of the bugs before we create them. Nobody wants to get up in the morning and see thousands of bugs created in their JIRA. So we wanted to make sure that we work with our PSER team closely to make sure that we create bugs that are more actionable. Uh, so for example, one of the metrics by which we are deciding to open bugs is by a package and vulnerability combination so that uh, we don't open thousands of issues and we, uh, give, we try to give optimal information in that one issue that is created. Um, we also wanted to kind of uh, look at the nuance of prioritization, which is a little different from severity of a particular vulnerability. Uh, we wanted to make sure that um, the issue management um, platform um, kind of understands that a high, I, I'm going to give you an example, a high a, a vulnerability which has severe, high severity doesn't mean that it always necessarily translates into high priority. For example, there could be um, source code within NVIDIA, which is more of a a core component which is shared by more than 10 business units which are critical to the business and if a vulnerability is found associated to that package we wanted to make sure that the issue management is kind of customizing the priority on that issue and last but not the least the most requested feature is allow listing uh, we wanted to make sure that may it be in pipeline and this is more actually critical in pipeline or may it be with our nightly scans we are always allowing our teams to kind of make progress by having a feature where they could come in and say that for this particular package or for this particular vulnerability we are aware about it but it's associated with a test platform or it is related to a transitive dependency that we don't have really control on um, or we are very early in our stages and, and we want to fix it later 
regulators. So we want to be able to have our issue management platform uh, kind of allow listing feature that would let them make progress. And calculating risk. Now that you have reports, notification, issue tracking, the final part of goal, like we say, we want to be able to kind of calculate a risk for a registered program with Inspect. Um, so here are some of the things that we are still in the process of ironing out before we can um, get to a place where we have an objective risk associated with every program. So one of the things that we need to consider is that the risk that we associate is normalized. And what I mean by that is different programs or different business units uh, can be at a different stage with inspect registration. So some of the teams could be coming in and have 90% of their code register or even 100. And some of the teams might not be ready yet and have about 10% of their code registered. So when we calculate a risk into our report dashboard, we want to make sure that we account for that factor. We want to make sure that when we calculate risk, it's multifaceted. And what I mean by that is, the severity versus priority discussion that we just had with the issue. We want to make sure that we are accounting for custom policies and um, shared code before we kind of uh, assess the risk for a particular program. We want to be able to take a look at um, the vulnerabilities when they were disclosed, how long have they been sitting into their reporting platform. And we also want to be able to know that a particular vulnerability can be uh, more public and it could uh, be more critical in terms of our PCER than others. And the severity can be like a plain measure to assess that. And last but not the least, we want to be able to get to a place, like I said, where we want, we have an objective risk associated. So we have been thinking of ideas like a scorecard, which would be a number, like a percentage number between zero to 100 that we could assign with a program. But at the same time, it should be explainable or it should be measurable. So um, our project management as well as our teams can clearly assess what is the risk associated with that program. So at this point, I would really like to uh, open it up to you guys if you want to share. Uh, what are the steps you are taking to get to that part of gold, which is a risk associated to a program in your company? Or if you have other questions, we would love to take them as well at this time. Thank you. We have a few minutes, I think, and I will try to run through as many questions as we possibly can. So first question, would you think a bank could use P-cert approach in general and your specific approach instead of a normal C-cert since they usually have many products, um, for example, online services? I, I am not sure about the difference between CSERT and PCERT, if you would be able to go all the way away from CSERT, but I definitely think that you could organize it in a way that um, maybe allow the products of the bank to be cataloged and then have dashboards for them in this way. Do you have any other thoughts on that, Dee? Yeah, no, that makes sense. I think uh, whatever we are doing with our automation in terms of different steps of registering, reporting, issue management, and notification, that applies to CSERT as well, not just PCERT. Okay, so next question. I'm just going to fire these at you. So, how do you handle oh, how do you handle feedback from your teams from the reports they receive? I'm thinking especially about false positives and issue slash risk acceptance. Is it just some kind of filter on off or something more so it can also benefit other teams? Yeah, that's kind of I think <laughs> the biggest thing that we're dealing with manually right now. Um, so because we have over a hundred and did you say 160 now products yeah. that we have registered D? Yeah. <laughs> so the amount of source code that we're scanning with the tool um, compared to the number of people that we have on the security tools team, we can't really manually go through all of them ourselves. So um, we are trying to come up with ideas of how we could build that sort of thing into the tool, maybe have a way where somebody could come in and give us like, um, you know, a rating on how well they think that the tool did, and we would be able to take that back and actually um, use some machine learning to help our reports aggregate things better. Any other thoughts on that, Dee? 
Yeah, no, and some of the tools that we work with have a way that you can um, tell or remediate a particular vulnerability by giving them more information about the version that the user is directly telling you rather than the one they discovered. So we are trying to come up with a way that we integrate that into our UI by making API calls to the underlying tools. Yeah, I think our first approach really is this allow listing. So having teams open up um, exceptions with the PSER team so that we can still track those, but then have a way to filter those out. Thank you. Next question. How do you identify false positives in scan reports before showing them in your dashboard? I think that really relates probably to the last one as well. At this point, we don't have a great way to identify false positives. So it's kind of on the team to go and tell us what is a false positive so we can dig into that more. Because there's no way that we can understand all of the source code, unfortunately, at, at the company. Yeah, I think developers know about their code the best, so we definitely need to partner with product teams. Although one of the ideas that Jessica and I have talked about is probably cross-referencing between different tools. So we could potentially build a system where the source code is scanned by multiple tools, and then we try to do a union of the res uh, intersection of result to kind of get closer to uh, reducing the false positives. Okay, and two more questions I'm going to try to squeeze in. So. Uh, have you developed criteria to semi-automate this prioritization or is this left for manual analysis? Uh, right now, um, the way uh, this is working is like we said, we are taking a lot of feedback manually from the product teams. Uh, but the way um, this could be automated is uh, by having features by which we would allow uh, something like bring your own policy, which is currently under development. So the, what we can do is um, for a specific team, they could define their policy by working with their security architect and our platform would just ingest that. And then that way the priority that our issue tracking um, system is aware about is more custom to what they bring in. Anything more, Jessica? I think at this point it is a manual analysis, um, but yes, we, we are hoping to get to it some sort of semi-automated. I also think that knowing which source code locations or repositories are used in the most places and the components that are used in the most products will give us kind of a best ROI so we could kind of drive those down first. So that would be a pretty easy way to automate because we could just easily see that. Okay, so final question. So this is a very impressive process and platform. Are there any plans to make it open source, which might be difficult, but overall the platform is great. So hoping for it. Oh, thank you. Uh, at this point, I don't think there's been plans to make it open source, um, but who knows? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there have been discussions to offer it uh, outside of NVIDIA for other companies, but uh, there haven't been talks about making it open source. Yeah. Okay, so I think um, we're three minutes over. So I think we will hand it over. Um, hand it over? No, we will end this session. <laughs> so thank you, Dee and Jessica, for um, this wonderful presentation. And thank you to all the participants for an engaging session with all of your questions. Um, thank you all. So this is the last, um, I think, breakout session of the day. And the keynote will be next in about 20 minutes. So please um, all take a break, grab a coffee and join the keynote. And I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day and a wonderful first conference. So thanks again, Dee and Jessica and everybody that came. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Bye. Bye.